Hello, and thank you for joining us on Giving Voice to Depression. I'm Bridget. And I'm Terry. More than 350 million people worldwide suffer from depression, but you do not have to have it yourself to be affected by it. Its prevalence pretty much guarantees that someone you care about battles its darkness. This podcast tries to shine some light into that darkness. We're not experts and we're not therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and who are committed to encouraging healthy, healing conversations about mental illness. Hi, Bridget. Hi, Terry. So it is National Mental Health Awareness Month. Happy May. Yes, who knew? It's actually been in existence since 1949. I think that surprised us both to hear, right? You'd think it was something (laughs) relatively new. Why in God's name are we still at this stage if we've been talking every May since 1949? Good question. Let's keep talking. Speaking of talking. So on the NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness site, they have a big section of share your story, which obviously is what we do. And in their language, it's important for people living with mental health conditions to know they're not alone. Sharing a story about your personal experiences with mental health challenges can help in your own recovery, as well as provide encouragement and support to others in similar experiences. And then it says you have an authentic voice. You can make a difference for yourself and others by sharing your experiences and perspective. There are all sorts of things that you know that other people want to know. You are not alone. Let them know they're not alone either. And we're about to hear a pretty authentic voice, Bridget. I was just going to say, Sarah is definitely (laughs) authentic. She is indeed. Let's listen as she gives voice to depression. There are those of us who quietly and reluctantly discuss our mental health. And then there's Sarah. Oh, well... I just feel like I need to do my part, you know? It's just like no bullshit allowed anymore. Just be loud and proud about who I am. Loud and proud about being a 28-year-old Midwestern-raised Brooklyn actress, teaching artist, and personal trainer. And I love eating cookie dough and watching pug videos. I adore pugs. I think that they are the funniest creatures. That Pugs and otters, that, that brings me a lot of joy. And while it's really important for everyone to know the little things that bring them joy, it can be a lifesaver when depression throws a wet blanket on all things good. I experience it sometimes situationally and sometimes absolutely just completely out of nowhere, sprouting from my own brain. Um, it, can, it can be triggered by uh, circumstances for um, something not going well in my, my professional career. But instead of it going from... I feel disappointed, I'm frustrated, I'm, I'm upset, but I know that there's another day or there might be another opportunity. It goes straight into, I'm worthless, what's the point? I, like, if I don't get this thing, I'll never get everything I need, which means I'll be a failure, which means I should just go die. Yep, she said, just go die. <laughs> yeah, well, it used to be drink, and then it's like, well, I can't drink, so I might as well die. Sarah says the reason she can laugh while she talks about what she calls her staircase to the bottom of the pit of despair is because she's in a support group, AA, where everyone is vulnerable, so there's little risk in disclosure. But she's very aware of the stigma outside of that safety. You know, we come from a puritanical basis, right? So America is based on these sort of British stiff upper lip. You just forge ahead. There are no feelings. There is no nuance. There is no vulnerability. And that's kind of what we founded our nation on. And I also believe that when we live in a patriarchy where no one is allowed to have feelings, especially men, that mental illness, which is basically vulnerability and emotions on level 10, it's not a it's not a sexy thing. It's not a productive thing. So I think that there's this idea of, well, we'll we won't look at it and then it'll just go away. But of course, it doesn't go away because depression isn't a choice. But since both ignorance and stigma are, we talked about those going away. To take the stigma away would provide so many more opportunities to ask for help. So I have a leaky bathroom faucet, and I know if I call my super, my super will come and fix it. And that's part of his job, come and fix things in our apartment. And there are so many people out there whose job it is to help people who struggle with mental illness. The problem is I have no shame in saying I have a leaky faucet, and and I would have more shame if I were like, I think I need to go on medication because I think I'm super depressed. 
and I think I can't live like this anymore. Um, and that certainly was my experience when I first started on this journey. Sarah's journey, like many of ours, has had its ups. When I'm feeling good, I think this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life. And its downs. When I'm feeling awful, a part of me is like, this is how it'll be for the rest of your life. And so when I feel bad after I'm feeling good, I'm like, not only am I feeling bad, but I'm also pissed that I'm feeling bad. And I'm frustrated. And I'm like, I don't understand why this happened again. What's wrong with me? How can I, why, why can't I do this right? Why can't I just do this perfectly? Why can't this just be over for me? Luckily, it's happened so many times at this point. I'm like, well, here we are again. All right, well, let's look at the list. What can you do? Sarah's list includes her support group, her friends, fiance, getting enough sleep, moving her body, being of service to others, and, of course, those pug videos. She also has something she tells herself about depression. It can't kill me unless I let it. So that's how I like to think of it, too. It's like, well... This feeling won't kill me. I cannot die from a feeling. The feeling will not come out in the middle of the night and smother me with a pillow or something, you know, or make me, you know, as long as I keep talking about it and keep doing the next right thing, I'm going to be fine. I'm already fine. I don't feel fine, but I am fine. I love how she literally gives the voice of depression a voice. She's actually speaking that crazy, wacky, lying voice. <laughs> you mean the going from zero to 60, the, well, you failed at that, so you may as well be dead crazy voice? Yes. Yes, I know. And hearing her describe her depression and the way she gets mad at it and everything, I, I was just delighted isn't the right word because it's not that kind of a topic, but it was really refreshing. Absolutely. It's as if she, you know, stripped back the power from it and is in dialogue with that the, that inner dialogue. And in doing that, she's stripping that charge off, which kind of objectifies it and makes it a little bit of distance between who we are and what that voice is saying. There's a little rip, a little separation there. And there are times we can do that, and then there are times we can't. Yes. And that is actually another piece of Sarah's story. One of the components that is a factor for both her and myself is hormones. And I asked her if there was anything at the end of our conversation that she wanted to say, and she wanted to sort of issue a warning to women who are using hormone-based uh, birth control to at least be aware of the possibility that it can play into this equation. So here's Sarah one more time. The worst suicidal ideations and the worst depression I ever felt. It was maybe my fourth year on a certain birth control. And I started it when I was 22. In July of 2014, I had this awful night where I really felt like I needed to kill myself. Never happened before that fast. Like where it was just like a waterfall of depression and suicidal ideation to the point where I was looking up like, suicidal prevention, like phrases on Tumblr, which I found a lot of Demi Lovato quotes, uh, kept me through, kept me okay. But it, my body was screaming at me to like throw myself in front of a train, just like go walk until you fall to the ground. Just, just crazy stuff. And this is just in the middle of the night, you know, it was awful. And I, I couldn't point to what happened because there's nothing circumstantially that was happening in my life where I felt okay, this is the reason. It's because I feel this way about this thing that happened. It was nothing. There's nothing going on. And it wasn't until my therapist and I were able to track it for a couple months about when did I start to feel this way? And it was when I was ovulating. Um, and once I was off of it and I got on a non-hormonal uh, birth control, I felt fine. I've never had an episode like that ever again. And the, the hormone piece can certainly rear its uh, potent and ugly head when you're taking hormone replacement, birth control, like Sarah mentions, menopause, pregnancy, puberty. Yep. Yep. In fact, next week, we're going to be talking with two lovely women um, about their experience with depression throughout their pregnancy and postpartum. And that, again, would be an incredibly hormonal as well as sleep deprived time. Absolutely. And I always have to throw in the thyroid piece, too. It can be that. It can be lots of things. And that's something, you know, we all have to keep an eye on. You know, I don't have that clarity. When I'm in it, I'm not that objective. No, oh, but she is. And it's a great role model. And I just love the no bullshit anymore philosophy. I do, too. It's just too. time to talk and time to be straight and real and just knock it off. Knock, knock the secrecy off because it just adds to the burden. 
Knock it off. Knock it off. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye. Love you. Bye. Bye. We hope that our podcasts bring about a little more understanding or help people articulate their experience of depression a little more. And thanks to each and every person who's digging deep and finding the words and finding the courage to give voice to depression. And you can find our podcasts on our website, givingvoicetodepression.com, as well as on iTunes, where we hope you will subscribe, rate, and respectfully comment. And please remember, if you're hurting, speak up. If someone else is hurting, listen up.